Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I just want to welcome you all on behalf of the SEG program. I'd like to welcome you to the special lecture by Professor Danny Roderick on growth miracles and disappointments through the lens of structural change. My name is Douglas Gollin. I'm one of the academic co-leads along with my the STEG program is a multi-year research program that aims to improve our understanding of the processes of structural change and both in low-income economies. The program is funded by the United Kingdom's Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Office as part of the UK aid effort, and we're really grateful for their support. I can't think of anybody better positioned to speak to the issues that the STEG program deals with than our speaker today. We're really grateful to you, Danny, for making the time to talk to the STEG audience. Um, Danny needs very little introduction to this, to this crowd, but um, Danny Roderick's a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard University and one of, the, one of the leading thinkers on the broad topics of growth, development, and change, the politics and the economics of those issues, and really to hear what he has to say today. Before I turn the floor over to him, I just want to say that what we have set up here is a webinar format. For those of you who have questions like who's today and have been talking, he's going to talk for about 35 minutes. And then if you put questions in the chat, I will <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and lump together the questions um, anyway, as best I can at the end. So if you're interested, so you without can. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you, Danny, and ask you to share your slides and to go ahead and present. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Doug, for, uh, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to do this. Um, uh, can you see my slides, Doug? Just give me a hands up, uh, yep, yeah, and then you can hear me fine, I hope. Uh, there was some Perfectly. before when you were introducing the session. Um, if I can hear you fine. Yep, yeah, great. Um, uh, thank you. So um, let's see. Um, so um, I want to... Um, this is a, a quick outline of what I want to cover, uh, depending on, on, on time. I want to start a little bit with some basic growth facts that, that motivate a number of big questions or, or, or puzzles that I want to address. I'm going to lay out a very simple conceptual framework um, and uh, try to interpret uh, those uh, puzzles through the lens of those frameworks. And if there is any time, uh, I may talk about what this implies, uh, what this way of looking at growth implies uh, for, for the future. Um, there's a series of, of papers I've done on my own or with, with, with co-authors um, that, I'm, that I'm putting together in this talk. Um, I haven't actually put together sort of these ideas in this form uh, um, anywhere yet. So maybe, I don't know if it, sounds all interesting to this audience, maybe I'll turn it into a paper. But right now it's just um, coming from a, a number of different background papers that I've, I've, I've listed here. Okay, some uh, very basic facts, most of which are going to be familiar, so I'm going to be uh, running through them rather quickly. Uh, one, of course, is, you know, the, the signal um, you know, growth experience um, uh, in the post-war period has been the, the, you know, a series of growth miracles, uh, mostly but not exclusively uh, in, in East Asia, um, very unprecedented rates of uh, uh, economic growth, labor productivity growth. I have here, you know, two countries, South Korea and Taiwan. Um, uh, but of course, uh, China um, after 1978 had very much a kind of a similar. So one of the you know key questions, obviously, is sort of you know what does structural change have to contribute to understanding our um, uh, sort of these these growth miracles? Um, the somewhat 
less well recognized uh, question has to do with the performance of a wide range of countries that pursued more inward looking policies import substituting industrialization policies although you know the general perception is that ISI um, uh, did not do that well. Um, there were quite a few countries um, in the Middle East um, uh, uh, and, and in Latin America uh, that actually did not do that badly under ISI at all. Um, so uh, the performance in sort of these countries that I have, um, so Brazil, uh, Mexico, Peru, uh, even in, in Sub-Saharan Africa countries like Kenya or Cote d'Ivoire, Turkey in the Middle East, um, actually had quite respectable uh, labor productivity growth rates uh, throughout much of their sort of ISI uh, experience. And in fact, their ISI experience, um, which may look uh, puzzling, uh, looks all the more puzzling if you um, uh, compare the experience under ISI with how many of these countries have done more recently after they transitioned um, towards what might be called Washington consensus policies or policies that were sort of more in line with uh, what economists thought were the right policies for growth. Um, you know, as you can see, is the difference between um, the, the blue and the uh, and the, the green bars uh, that the vast majority of countries actually did much worse um, after they transitioned uh, post 1990 um, into um, the. Uh, um, a new set of policies that ab abandoned their inward-looking development strategies. It's not true for all countries. You can see here that um, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, Chile, for example, did much better um, after 1990 compared to before. Uh, but in, in general, uh, the, the blue bars are significantly um, taller than, than, than the green bars. Um, this was compensated to some extent uh, by um, what um, uh, the experience that we had uh, in the period um, just before sort of the pandemic. Um, and I think it's it's one can talk about a, a period of, of um, pre-pandemic growth accelerations around the world uh, that was actually quite um, spread out. So, um, you know, four specific countries that I might talk ab about a little bit more are sort of it would be Ethiopia and Tanzania in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, India in South Asia, um, Peru uh, in, in, in Latin America um, uh, that, that had very significant uh, growth accelerations um, uh, either in the, um, um, you know, in the 90s or the early 2000s, actually in India, the growth acceleration starts in the early um, 1980s. Um, now, it, we know that in, in, in general, um, sort of growth accelerations or, or rapid growth is has been associated with rapid industrialization. And if you look at the experience of countries that what I've called here are miracle countries, countries that experience growth rates for sustained periods of uh, increase in labor productivity of 4.5% per year um, compared to other countries. They are they do look distinctive in terms of their industrialization experience. That is that they, uh, they industrialize much more rapidly and sustained much higher levels of industrialization at any level of, of, of income. And I'll talk um, a, a bit more about the, the sense in which industrialization was critical for uh, rapid growth um, uh, later. But one thing that is uh, quite clear and uh, you know will be part of the, the, the puzzles I'll, I'll, I'll try to address is that that recent growth booms, these pre-pandemic growth accelerations were actually, unlike earlier growth accelerations, were not associated by rapid industrialization. Uh, so here are the four countries I had mentioned earlier. Um, as pre-pandemic uh, growth boom countries, Ethiopia, Tanzania, India, and, and Peru. Um, really, only one of those countries looks like um, they've um, experienced um, a sustained uh, industrialization. That's uh, uh, um, Ethiopia, the blue uh, line here. And even in the case of Ethiopia, when you look at it a little bit closer, uh, you find that the quality of industrialization was very poor in the sense that the the bulk of uh, growth uh, in employment uh, in manufacturing um, uh, came from small-scale, informal, highly unproductive enterprises. Uh, so that this 
period of, of um, you know, that Ethiopia's growth was not actually driven by manufacturing or industrialization at all. Um, again, an issue that I'll come back to uh, later. So um, this is a sort of a very quick tour um, of, of some basic facts um, uh, that, that motivate um, uh, the talk and uh, th the puzzles that, um, that these facts uh, uh, collectively pose uh, are something like this. So that, that we want to sort of understand uh, East Asian growth miracles, um, but we also want to understand uh, the surprisingly good performance under ISI uh, um, associated with policies that were sort of that the profession looks much uh, less kindly on. Um, we want to understand uh, what, why the response to the reforms of the Washington consensus um, in the 80s, uh, why the response was so tepid. Um, and we want to understand um, sort of this, this pre-COVID growth booms. And I think the key issue with respect to these pre-COVID uh, growth booms um, is uh, both that they were, um, uh, um, you know, that they took place despite uh, industrialization playing uh, a, a leading role, and also that uh, that from everything that appears, that the fact that you know they, you know, they disappeared has less to do with the pandemic and much more to do with the fact that they did not seem sustainable. So there was an unsustainable element associated with these growth booms uh, that I think would form part of the. Uh, the set of puzzles that I would like to address. All right, so, um, so what would be the, the kind of framework that I want to put together um, on which I'm going to hang these facts, or at least you know use um, a, use the framework as a kind of a descriptive device to to address these uh, uh, these these puzzles. Um, there are going to be there's there's three critical uh, building blocks. Um, one is um, sort of simply the story about conditional convergence, um, just straightforward, comes from the neoclassical uh, growth model, um, and that's going to point to the role of fundamentals, so the long run determinants of you know steady state uh, levels of income. So I'll call these fundamentals. You know, I'll, I'll leave it fairly open as what these fundamentals might be. They might be things like institutions, governance, human capital. So all the things that sort of we, you know, you know, think that sort of matter for the long run. Uh, so this is um, the second element uh, is a story about unconditional convergence. And I'm going to argue uh, that certain modern sectors, um, in particular formal organized manufacturing, has a feature that's very different uh, from the rest of the economy, has, has features of unconditional convergence, and that's going to be the second element. And then the third element, uh, which is really about structure, is going to differentiate between those, the modern versus the traditional parts of the economy, uh, where in the modern sector, we have these um, uh, uh, activities that are subject to condition, unconditional convergence. And the structuralist feature of the story is, of course, that there are persistent gaps in marginal productivities across these sort of modern versus traditional sectors. So structural dualism is, is, is the third uh, critical um, uh, uh, factor um, on critical uh, building block. Okay, so let me build each one of these in part. Again, so the theory of convergence uh, is, is is sort of is well known um, that you know uh, um, that closed or open economy versions of neoclassical growth model would suggest that basically there ought to be some convergence. Lower income countries should grow more uh, rapidly. Um, that can happen either through higher savings in the closed economy model, um, or it can happen through you know kind of a um, uh, um, 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 uh, I should say high return, higher rates of return to capital, essentially being the, the critical factor, whether it's in the closed or the um, or, or the open economy version, the open economy version um, availability of savings from abroad uh, um, uh, is an additional lever, additional mechanism, and that sort of translates to the simple standard convergence story. Uh, which says um, that countries um, that start lower levels of income or labor productivity uh, should grow more rapidly. Beta here is the convergence rate. Um, we know that the implications of the standard neoclassical convergence story does not hold uh, 
uh, do not hold in the data, whether we look at the sort of the long-term evidence or we look at sort of shorter evidence uh, from more recent periods, um, instead of having a kind of a negative relationship between initial levels of um, labor productivity and subsequent growth rates, uh, we have something closer to a zero relationship or, if anything, a kind of a positively sloped relationship, although not uh, statistically significant. So uh, there has been until recently no evidence in the data of unconditional convergence. Um, there is in the more recent period uh, in the pre-pandemic, perhaps associated with these um, uh, growth um, uh, bursts or the, the pre-pandemic um, uh, growth booms that I mentioned at the outset, and the fact that those were pretty sort of widely scattered around the developing world, that we do have um, some uh, unconditional convergence in the data uh, for the period after 1990. But what's critical also here is that this is actually a very, very slow rate of unconditional convergence. The beta estimated beta coefficient here would be the order of 0.3%, implying that it would actually take more than two centuries uh, to close half the income gap um, uh, with, the, with the frontier. Um, so some evidence of con unconditional convergence more recently, but it's, it's very, very slow rates of unconditional convergence. Uh, certainly compared to some of the betas I'll show you in, in a second. Oops. Um, okay. Now, um, so unconditional convergence, you know, sort of in general is either very slow or doesn't exist at all. Um, uh, so that is really what um, has sort of led, uh, you know, the, the you know, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in convergence story for us to talk really about more like about a, a, a conditional convergence uh, story uh, that says that suppose there are these fundamentals uh, that countries differ in their potential long run uh, steady state income levels. Um, and um, and that might mean that in, in that, that essentially the long run income levels are going to deter that will be function of these uh, sort of uh, fundamentals that differ across countries. Let this, uh, you know, the fundamentals be captured by this vector of variables in this theta, uh, um, and then what we will uh, get is a version of the um, condition uh, convergence equation that will also depend on these conditioning variables, uh, these 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 uh, thetas, and of course, as you know, uh, once we take into account some of these uh, fundamentals, uh, then um, uh, the uh, we get a very nice conditional convergence story. Um, so we can see the difference here between the unconditional and the conditional version of the convergence story here. Sort of my list of fundamentals in quotation marks are things like sort of life expectancy, institutional quality, and, and latitude. Um, just even just with those three things, uh, we get a very nicely uh, negatively sloped uh, relationship, suggesting that sort of these fundamentals do matter because they might shape a long run income levels. So once you do that, then of course we have we get a beta that's um, you know sort of something around uh, two percent, uh, much higher uh, uh, rate of convergence once we account for these fundamentals. Um, now, um, the the next thing um, is um, to take into account that there might be some sectors in the economy so far i've talked about the economy and the aggregate um but you know we take into account some of the structural features of the economy um uh, that uh, that there might be some parts of the economy where in fact um uh, there is unconditional convergence and i'll call that part of the economy where there is unconditional convergence formal manufacturing activities um then uh, we can think about this convergence equation applying to simply that uh, particular subsector alone, just for for manufacturing. And it it, it turns out that that when you do that, uh, there is in very strong evidence of unconditional convergence within formal manufacturing. Um, and this is sort of two versions of that uh, unconditional convergence uh, scatter plot. Uh, um, one at for aggregate formal manufacturing, 
and the other one as you know sort of in, in two digit manufacturing turns out that this holds regardless of whether you do it in two digit one digit or aggregate uh, uh, manufacturing um, and not only is this um, sort of there's this very definite uh, statistically significant uh, negative relationship for formal manufacturing uh, it's also that this beta coefficient is actually fairly high in, um, it's around three percent um, so uh, unconditional convergence in formal manufacturing is even more rapid than conditional convergence in our typical uh, kind of, of, of convergence uh, e equation. Okay. Um, now, so that makes manufacturing actually um, uh, especially important in the process of, of convergence. Um, and I think there's, there's essentially three features that have made manufacturing particularly um, uh, important as an escalator for growth. One is that it is subject to this um, uh, unconditional convergence, so that it's easier to catch up in manufacturing. Apparently, maybe it's easier to just simply copy the, uh, the technology there than in sort of services or in non-traditional agriculture. But the second thing is that traditionally, um, uh, manufacturing has been, you know, as, you know, has been relatively low skill activity, so that, um, you know, that the it has been easier to scale up because there are there are fewer constraints on the supply side that you can just draw a lot of workers from uh, agriculture or from informal activities. So that manufacturing has this labor absorption capacity. Um, that is means that that the, that the you know the escalator is, is can be quite wide in terms of how, how many people can get on it. That is consistent with low incomes factor uh, endowments, um, and also on the demand side, tradability means that there aren't constraints on the demand side as well. So you can manufacturing can keep on expanding because you can actually sell uh, to uh, on world markets. So you can expand without turning the terms of trade against you. Whereas if you were the same thing was happening in a domestic non-traded service sector, uh, you, you know you can't you can't keep on expanding if productivity in the rest of the economy isn't keeping up, uh, because relative pro profitability and relative prices will end up declining. So if you put those three elements, uh, then uh, this would make manufacturing an extremely important uh, vehicle uh, for for rapid economic growth. Now, how would that? Um, uh, sort of work really if we put these three these various elements uh, together. So um, let's distinguish then between a kind of a modern se sector that's sort of subject to uh, uh, unconditional convergence. Now the ability of the modern sector to drive growth is going to be limited by the fact that in a typical low-income country, its size initially is going to be very small. Um, so yes, on the one hand, uh, the modern sector has its own internal positive dynamic. On the other hand, its ability to derive the rest of the economy at the early stages of growth is limited by the fact that it starts out being very, very slow. And uh, the problem is that we've seen very rapid growth uh, in some of these very low income countries in, initially in East Asia. Now, the second sector, the traditional sector is subject to conditional convergence. So this is going to be uh, the bulk of the economy initially. And then structural dualism is reflected in the fact that labor productivity is uh, is a multiple of labor in the modern sector is a multiple of the labor productivity uh, in the traditional sector. So these labor productivities are denoted by pies. Okay, so this is going to then produce a model, of, you know, a very stylized, um, you know, sort of almost heuristic kind of a model that produces three channels of growth. Um, and, and the three channels of growth are this, that is, is Y hat is the rate of labor productivity growth, uh, that we can express it as the sum of uh, three channels uh, labeled here is A, B, and C. Um, a is simply the conditional uh, convergence channel. All that it says is that as you accumulate fundamentals, uh, your long run level of income is going to get higher, and that's going to uh, kick in the process of conditional convergence, okay? The second uh, channel is uh, the uh, channel B, is the process of unconditional convergence in manufacturing. Um, you'll see that theta fundamentals don't enter in channel B uh, because uh, it's an automatic unconditional convergence channel. Uh, 
Um, and that occurs only in that part of the economy that is, let's say, the formal manufacturing and the share of the, the part of the formal sector that is subject um, to uh, unconditional convergence. Now, that is multiplied by alpha M, the share of labor in the manufacturing sector or in the modern sector. So this is, goes to the point that you can have very rapid uh, unconditional convergence in manufacturing, but if, if the share in the economy is very low, uh, it's not going to be driving, uh, it's going, not going to have much effect uh, early on. And the third channel, C, uh, is the structural change channel. As you move labor uh, from the traditional to the modern sector, so as D alpha M is positive, uh, you get a productivity boost uh, um, in the economy as a whole that's driven by the labor productivity differential between the two sectors, pi M minus uh, pi T. Okay, so this is really those are the, here are the, the, you know, the, the the three channels. Unconditional A captures the conditional convergence channel. Uh, B captures uh, the process of unconditional convergence uh, in modern uh, formal manufacturing sectors. C captures uh, the structural uh, change channel. Um, so uh, the in, in terms of the roles that they're going to play in, in, in growth, um, the uh, accumulation of fundamentals, um, uh, that's going to be essential for long run growth, uh, but it doesn't produce very, very rapid growth. You cannot get, uh, you know, the kind of East Asian style growth miracles out of the uh, accumulation of fundamentals. Uh, so the convergence uh, the, the conditional convergence parameter that we have estimated in these growth regressions is not compatible with generating um, uh, 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 sort of growth miracles. So you'll get steady, but not miraculous growth rates. Can't really explain East Asia. Um, unconditional convergence in modern sector, that could be quite rapid, uh, but, you know, is unfortunately, you know, has to remain quantitatively quite small at the early stages of development because the formal sector is relatively small to start with. Where you can get actually a lot of kick is precisely the structural change channel. Uh, it can, can drive very rapid growth early on uh, if industrialization is rapid. So if this, you are very, you know, sort of, you're very successful at moving uh, the resources from uh, um, the low productivity traditional sector to, under, um, to the higher productivity modern sector. So that would be one argument as to why, as we, we will talk about ISI, where a lot of things that looks like they are very not very helpful to productivity, like protectionism and subsidies and so forth, can still produce very high rate of growth as long as it's driving very rapid structural change uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in, in the right direction. Um, so just to get a you know quantitative sense of this, um, if we just you know parameterize um, this uh, with you know very simple uh, sort of assumptions on what some of the key parameters are, um, and if we assume that we have rapid industrialization, like um, the alpha is one percent per year, it's not too far off from what South Korea and Taiwan had in their very high growth rate uh, periods. And then we can see how the three components, um, the three mechanisms, A, B, and C, the three channels um, are, are playing into the overall growth rate of the economy. So you have um, the, uh, the purple um, uh, you know, line is, is the aggregate growth rate, the total growth. And you can see how that you know, is decomposed uh, into the, um, the three uh, channels. And really, you know, the, the biggest part is really being uh, contributed by the structural uh, change channel. So that's the sense in which, you know, structural change is what's driving growth miracles um, uh, when you can actually have this kind of a very rapid um, uh, 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 industrialization process taking place. So, um, so with that, um, you know, we can now turn to our sort of different uh, models of growth or different uh, episodes of growth and, and, and sort of tell a story uh, about how uh, this framework um, sort of descriptively does in terms of, of uh, you know, sort of, this, you, know, pr you know, telling us a story about what was driving growth in each one of these periods. Now, under ISI, you know, sort of the general story was that, you know, fundamentals were weak um, um, and therefore, you know, channel A did not necessarily make a huge amount of contribution. 
Um, uh, the uh, uncon unconditional convergence in modern sector, well, perhaps yes, but again, um, you know, didn't, you know, initially those sectors are relatively small. Uh, but where, what we can see from sort of, you know, uh, uh, shift share type of labor productivity decompositions for the ISI period is that we got huge labor productivity boost, uh, boost that was uh, taking place uh, from the structural chain channel. So maybe in many respects, um, the specific policies that were pursued under ISI uh, did not look like they were very efficiency promoting at the level of firms or at the level of with individual sectors, uh, but they did promote rapid industrialization uh, in those countries that I mentioned earlier, whether it's um, uh, Colombia or Mexico or Brazil or Turkey. And that was a large part of uh, the very rapid growth uh, that these countries um, experienced under, under ISI. Now, in the, the export-oriented industrialization episodes like South Korea and Taiwan, um, in fact, had even more rapid um, uh, uh, structural um, transformation or structural change because uh, the manufacturing that they were promoting were explicitly oriented towards export markets. So they, they could grow much more, you know, so the, there were much fewer constraints uh, in terms of uh, on the demand side for the expansion uh, of, of the various manufacturing sectors that were being promoted through their industrial policies. And so while many countries like you know, Turkey, Brazil, Mexico, certainly by the 1980s were running into, by the 1970s, were running into kind of uh, demand side constraints because their manufacturing sectors were not globally very uh, competitive. Uh, these countries were able to, to sort of sustain ongoing and very rapid uh, structural change for, for much, uh, uh, you know, both had more rapid structural change and, 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 and keep it going for, for longer as well. Um, when it comes to the disappointments of the, um, the, the Washington consensus, um, uh, remember the, the, the story here is that, is that starting in the mid 1980s, a lot of these countries, um, uh, mostly in Latin America and elsewhere, and also Sub-Saharan Africa, really, um, you know, uh, embarked on more, embarked on much more market-friendly policies. Uh, removed many of these the protection and the subsidies and the import substitution policies of the past, uh, but really didn't uh, grow uh, very very rapidly. Um, and I think uh, a a critical part of this story is really what happened in the process of structural change. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the paradox in these countries, when you look at, at countries like Brazil or Mexico um, after the um, late 1980s, uh, is that within manufacturing, there was significant amount of productivity growth. Uh, but this was all happening in the context of a shrinking formal manufacturing sector. Um, and uh, in the context of structural change actually moving in the wrong direction. Uh, so instead of the modern sectors expanding, you had the modern sectors sort of shrinking as part of the um, uh, entire economy. So structural change from the modern to the traditional sector uh, was either even weak or in many cases actually negative. If you, contribute, if you look at, again, the same kind of of the labor productivity decompositions. Uh, if you look after the 1990s for Latin American countries, you find that on average, um, uh, structural change contributed negatively to overall growth. That is to say that labor was moving from higher productivity activities to lo lower productivity activities. Large part of this was a process of the industrialization. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, in Africa, for example, the um, uh, the shrinking of parastatals was also uh, a part of this uh, um, shrinkage of the more formal, more modern parts of the economy. So what looked like actually was efficient, efficiency enhancing because these, these sectors may not have been the most productive uh, parts of the economy, but they were still more productive than the next best source of employment uh, for the workers that were released uh, from, from these sectors. Um, finally, with respect to the um, the, the pre-COVID uh, growth booms, um, as I said, what was special about this period was that uh, the uh, 
uh, this was not industrialization led. Rapid formal expansion, expansion of formal manufacturing was not a key part uh, of this growth experience. Uh, there was significant structural change uh, in these um, uh, growth booms, but structural change took the form of people leaving the countryside uh, to go on to the um, uh, urban services, most of which were actually informal, petty, rather um, sort of, you know, services that may have had um, higher productivity than in traditional agriculture, but weren't kind of on a on a on a on, on an unconditional um, uh, uh, convergence uh, trajectory like uh, formal manufacturing. So think, for example, of construction. So the story in India is really uh, labor moving out of uh, traditional agriculture into urban uh, construction. Uh, you get the one-time boost of uh, increase in, in overall labor productivity because labor productivity in construction is, is higher than in traditional agriculture. But you don't get this uh, sustained boost because construction is not on a productive trajectory. In fact, uh, the more rapid was structural change, um, the worst was labor productivity growth in the modern sectors where labor moved in uh, because there was a kind of a crowding and diminishing marginal product um, kind of a, an effect working uh, in these more uh, service uh, um, kind of, 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 of sectors. Okay, so this is, that's a very kind of a, you know, if there are questions, I'm happy to fill in some of the empirical details uh, behind uh, these very broad uh, brush stories uh, that I, I just gave you, but I find this framework overall helpful in, in putting together a, you know, kind of a co coherent story about these different, uh, these different uh, growth episodes. I'll just end on sort of, you know, what this uh, tells us about the future of economic growth. I think the big, big changes that sort of, you know, you know our, our traditional model of economic growth is really where we have um, a pattern of structural change where labor used to go from, um, you know, traditional agriculture into formal organized manufacturing, sort of the standard industrialization path. And then eventually after you reach middle income or, 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 or higher, then there would be a move into the tertiary sector. Today, uh, the pattern of structural change uh, looks like this. Um, it's not that uh, you know workers aren't leaving or farmers are not leaving the farm. There is still process of urbanization. People are going into the leaving the countryside and agriculture, but it's really uh, it's moving into services in urban areas and mostly informal petty services that don't kind of have the the uh, the technological characteristics that that. I've identified with formal manufacturing, namely uh, unconditional convergence. Um, and and so I think that that creates important dilemmas and questions about what the future of growth is. One, it means that, that it implies a significant lowering of the ceiling for what's attainable growth. Uh, once you, you've lost the ability of, in, you know, once, once you've lost industrialization as a significant vehicle for very rapid growth, uh, that definitely lowers the ceiling for growth. So I think it makes growth miracles much less likely in the future. It also means that from the, for the purpose of promoting economic growth, um, uh, you know, such strat strategies have to be much more service oriented uh, than focusing on, um, on, on manufacturing. Um, and that means focusing much more on smaller and medium sized enterprises, on services that are producing for the home market, as opposed to focusing on larger firms that are likely to compete uh, on global markets. So it, it, it entails a strategy that's sort of very different um, than, uh, than the kinds of strategies that have um, uh, paid off in the past. Um, you know, what, what that means for the details of economic policy and economics, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, development strategy, I think is still very much kind of an open question, but I think we're moving into a world where it'll take um, very different kinds of policies uh, um, to, to succeed on, on, on the growth end and uh, has done to date because of, of uh, the spe special features of, of manufacturing. So, um, uh, I've, I've talked for, for a long time, uh, so 
let me just uh, stop here and, and stop sharing. I may go back to some of my slides if there are uh, specific questions. Um, so um, let me just stop here and turn it over to you, uh, Doug, um, for any questions in the chat box or anything else or any discussion. I think Doug may have gotten disconnected. He was having some internet difficulty um, at the moment, so. Okay, um, so since we're, it seems like we're in an unmoderated. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can cover uh, for a while, but let me just uh, thank you for much for the, the comments. And there are, there is a great number of uh, um, questions and comments in the chat. So um, let's just move yeah, so right. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot here. Let's move right to uh, those, yeah. So let me just pick uh, on one. Yeah, so that, I, I see one question, I think it's from, so this, this was something that I, was in my slides, and but I left it out. So on, on the experience, so I think, I, I believe this may have been uh, Francisco Guerra, a missing element in the narrative left out from the averages uh, crisis, the low, gro low growth period from 1975 to 1990. Is that something we should ignore? So that's, that's a good question of what happened. And this is, of course, you know, I would say the low growth period is really 1980. Um, so history it's, it's, it's starts more like in the 1980s. Uh, it, it's a debt crisis, of course. So this is the period of the debt crisis. And there's an interesting question um, of whether the, you know, the debt crisis was a a consequence of the ISI. So I've I've painted a, a rather, you know, a, 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 a more positive picture of ISI than is usually um, the case. And I think often people sort of say, well, look, the ISI failed because of what happened during the during the 1980s. Uh, you know, the the fact is that the the fundamental drivers of the debt crisis, I think, were different than the policies of ISI. I mean just basic economics tells us that the debt crisis was really about macro, the, the inability to adjust your spending to your aggregate income. So it was a macro failure. So it was, you know, excessively, uh, you know, sort of, you know, the, the, the policies that were pursued after the the oil shock and, and the inability to, to rein in aggregate spending um, uh, was really the, the fundamental uh, reason behind the, the debt crisis the, the, and then the subsequent uh, sort of lost decade of the 1980s. You know, it took a while for the macro for in, for the inflation to be reduced, whereas ISI policies were really about sort of relative prices, changing you know the structure of the economy. Um, some of the worst ISI, you know, some of the countries that screwed up their relative prices the most really didn't have any significant debt crisis, or they were able to recover very quickly. India, uh, for example, uh, is is clearly a case that had very screwed up relative prices. Uh, very rigid ISI, but didn't really, or, or had really very, very, you know, um, you know, quick lived that crisis, nothing like, like Latin America. Um, and then of course, we know that, that East Asian countries would get to have their, their own debt crisis in the late 1990s. So it's not like, um, you know, having, you know, export orientation, you, you know, would prevent you from getting into, into, into that crisis. So I think that's a distinction between micro and macro. And I think you know the countries that that you know mismanage their macro policies um, sort of would would get into these uh, uh, financial crises, and um, and that would um, you know that obviously had very negative effects on girls. So so I didn't spank too much about about that period because I think it has to do with these sort of macro policies rather than these uh, structural policies. Um, um, a second question is yep. uh, from Bernardo uh, Calderola, who's sort of asking about what's endogenous and what's exogenous in these models, and what do we what we ought to think about it is underlying uh, uh, primitives, and you know, sort of what's equilibrium yep. outcomes. Yeah. So, um, so I would say what's um, um, what 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 is the 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 the, the what would be exogenous um, are are the things in this model that are sort of directly related to 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 policy sort of like the the um, the exogenous component of fundamentals sort of like you know the quality of institutions and and governance the investments in human capital uh, and so forth so that that would be the exogenous component 
of the fundamentals. And then the, 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 um, uh, the alpha, of course, structural change, uh, which is a key intermediate vehicle is, is endogenous, but the, the idea is that there's a bunch of policy variables uh, that are behind uh, sort of the rate of, of uh, structural change. Those could be, you know, either policies that remove, uh, that, that make markets work better, uh, or it is government interventions that are actually sort of accelerating structural change, whether it's, it's through import protection, subsidies, export orientation, export subsidy, whatever is being done to accelerate the process of structural change. So, so I think in terms of that framework, I think of the, the exogenous variables as essentially being uh, the, the various policies that, that, uh, that can drive, um, you know, the accumulation of fundamentals on the one hand and the rate of structural change on the other. So there's, I'm, I'm trying to, I know the time is short, so I'm trying to group some of these questions together for you. There's a couple of different questions about, um, I think they're linked actually. One is about agriculture. And do we wanna just think about agriculture as purely traditional or are there the modern technologies? Is there rapid, in a lot of the models, rapid technological change is what's driving people out of agriculture. So that's one set of questions. And the other set of questions is where's the role in services modern services in all of this. And I think another question might be uh, tradable services um, in all these things, thinking like India. Um, so could you address uh, you know, both of those sides as well? No, great. Yeah, so, uh, so agriculture and services are both a hodgepodge of different things. So when I was talking about agriculture, I was mainly focusing on traditional agriculture. And it's quite clear that you know, there are a lot of productivity enhancing opportunities in non-traditional agriculture, export-oriented cash crops and, and, and so forth, whether it's, you know, horticulture, or whether it's, um, you know, um, uh, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, shrimp and, 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 and salmon or, you know, so there's, there's, you know, so there are, parts of agriculture that look very modern and that could have technological or productivity trajectories that are much closer to that that I've associated with formal manufacturing with the process of industrialization. So having said that, it's very difficult to envisage uh, agriculture in aggregate uh, becoming a labor absorbing sector of the economy. So the problem becomes when you look at, you know, sort of agriculture as an alternative to um, uh, the uh, manufacturing, uh, it doesn't quite play that, it, it, it can't quite play that role because, you know, agriculture is likely to um, sort of shed labor. In fact, it's more likely to shed labor the more productive it becomes. Um, and, and therefore, so from the central development challenge becomes, yes, by all means, let's increase, um, you know, productivity in agriculture through diversification and, and moving into these non-traditional, uh, you know, uh, uh, more productive agricultural products. But, you know, the, the question remains, where will the good jobs, where will the most productive jobs come from for, you know, for the people who need them, which is going to be this, you know, mass of people in urban areas who looked at. So agriculture in that sense, it is not, I think, the answer to, to this conundrum. Well, what about services, in particular tradable services? So that's another source of heterogeneity that very crudely speaking, we can think of services being, you know, two kinds of services. One, again, you know, you know, tradable services that have very high productivity may exhibit the kind of uh, technological trajectory that um, I've associated with modern manufacturing. If you think about, you know, IT, business process, uh, you know, outsourcing and things like that. Um, but, you know, the problem with those services are that uh, they tend to be very skill intensive relative to the factor endowments um, uh, of the typical low income country or even a middle income country. So, they're also limited in terms of how much of the economy's labor they can absorb. And, and you know, you can see this, you know, even in a country like India, which has been relatively successful uh, with these high productivity services, uh, you know, basically, you know, you still need to find jobs or the 95% of the labor force that really can't be employed in call centers or in IT uh, or in BPO. Um, and again, so that's the sense in which these tradable services are not going to be the, the, the answer. 
And, and so by illumination, you're left with this sort of non-tradable services, which are currently dominated uh, by very, you know, unproductive informal service activities and, 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 you know, needing to find ways of increasing productivity there is the, really the only way of, of, of absorbing uh, the labor that's being released um, uh, from, from, from uh, agriculture. Thanks, Adani. Um, Penny Goldberg, let me just, as a quick follow-up on that, she says, any thoughts on the recent paper by Fan, Peters, and Zillabadi that claims that growth in India has been service-led, i.e. driven by rapid productivity growth in services? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a part of that 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 um, story that's consistent with what I'm saying, that it's clearly, if you look at the contribution of uh, structural change in 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 India to their growth experience, it's been you know people moving into into um, agriculture uh, into services um, and and in particular you know I think you know construction has been a very big uh, driver of, of this. So you have a you you get this you know sort of productivity boost for the economy as a whole. Um, but uh, you know, but you know, the productivity dynamic in the in the service areas that are absorbing a lot of the workers is not does not have a hugely positive trajectory. Uh, you know, it's IT and BPO and call centers that's great, uh, but that's not absorbing a lot of workers. Um, and and the sectors that are absorbing a lot of workers, um, uh, like construction, don't have this. Uh, technological properties. They're not, they're not. So there's a kind of a self, if, you know, self-limiting uh, process to this growth, which would be my interpretation of the Indian growth experience. That India got, you know, the, the significant growth benefits out of this one-time move uh, into uh, out of 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 uh, agriculture from the countryside into urban areas, almost like a, a bootstraps kind of a growth because. If you have, for whatever reason, people get, you know, more optimistic about the future of growth in India, they start investing. That creates demand. That creates, you know, sort of demand for services. That's going to create the jobs in construction. And as people move into construction from traditional agriculture, you will get the increase in productivity that will validate those positive uh, expectations. But that doesn't, you know, that 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 is not self-sustaining in the sense of. Uh, manufacturing would be because you don't have this upward trajectory of productivity uh, in uh, in most of the services that are absorbing the, the, the workers. Um, we have a couple, I mean, we have a lot of questions. I'm trying to go through as quickly as possible and, and capture some of them, but we have some about um, more on manufacturing. Uh, one of the many people have registered as Ed Sellers <laughs> Um, is asking is it, what about informal small scale manufacturing? Is that not really something important to growth? And if we look at historical episodes, what, isn't that like a first step toward growth? And then related to that, almost on the other side, uh, Ubit Casa is saying that you know the the focus on small and medium sized firms and not really large firms. If we think about you know isn't openness. Um, through trade and exports, going to lead to larger firms, the kind of the larger firms that you we associate with the formal sector uh, more. And Joe, just to jump in, I think we're going to need to wrap up with those questions. So, Danny, um, after you answer, we'll, we'll close in just a minute or two. Yeah, I mean, so on on productive heterogeneity in manufacturing. Um, so we've looked at this. Uh, specifically in the context of two um, uh, sub-Saharan African countries, Ethiopia and Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania has not had a huge amount of uh, growth in manufacturing, but Tanzania has, I mean, man Ethiopia has uh, from somewhere like from 2% of um, employment in manufacturing, something like 10% of employment in manufacturing. And many people have talked about Ethiopia becoming maybe sort of like a, uh, a kind of a mini East Asian case in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But but what we find is that most of that growth has um, happened in, in very small scale uh, informal micro enterprises in manufacturing. So a lot of you know, manufacturing in, in, uh, in, in Ethiopia, if you go outside a few firms in, you know, sort of maybe garments and leather and so forth uh, are, are very, very productive. 
very, um, and, and their productivity, when we distinguish by firm size, um, you look at firms, uh, you know, below um, 10, 15 employees, basically employment, you know, that's where you have all the employment growth. And that's where you have essentially zero, well, not zero, but very low productivity growth. The, where you get the productivity growth is in the larger, more export-oriented firms, but that's not where you get the employment growth. So the, the conundrum is that, and that's linked to the question about trade, uh, a lot of these firms that are being forced to compete on world markets, either in their home markets or in world markets, are having to adopt technologies that are you know, completely inappropriate to their factor endowments because they have to upgrade, they have to, you know, put in capital uh, and they have to produce the quality standards that are required on, on global markets. And that's relatively skill and capital intensive uh, technologies. And therefore these very, you know, the larger firms with, you know, sort of that can compete in the sort of, you know, the, with, you know, insert themselves in global value chains and so forth. They do very well productivity wise. They do very poorly employment wise. And where does the employment go? It goes into these uh, smaller firms that have maybe their local market niches. They're not directly competing uh, with, um, uh, uh, with, with, with global firms or, or Chinese um, uh, exporters and so forth. And, 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 and the general thing is that, well, you know, they're not, their productivity performance is, is, is very poor. Um, uh, and, and so, I mean, we do, I mean, I think we will have to work with uh, trying to find ways of increasing their productivity. And I think the, the recent work that on, you know, how to support firms with business training, um, with, um, you know, other kinds of business services and uh, business extension and so forth. I think that's, that's very important to learn about how, um, you know, uh, one can enhance productivity in these smaller and medium-sized enterprises, but the reality is very few of them will actually grow and become successful. So there's a very difficult policy challenge as to who you deal with, who you select uh, these firms into, into these programs. Danny, I'm conscious that you have to go to another meeting, another seminar. Um, so I think we probably need to wrap up the session here um, with apologies to everyone who had questions that we weren't able to get to. I'll try to harvest those questions and maybe we can put those to you for a bit of a Q&A to go on the website with the recording of this lecture, if you're willing to tackle a few selected ones of those questions. But for now, Danny, I just wanna, I wanna thank you so much for making the time and for, for a really fascinating lecture um, right at the heart of the issues that Steg is concerned with. So um, I hope that everybody can join me in giving either a real or virtual round of applause. Thank you so much, Professor Roderick. We really appreciate your making the time and, and all the best. So thank, thank you, Doug. And thank you for, thanks to everybody who's, who showed up. And I apologize, there are lots of interesting questions in the chat and I apologize that we won't have- time. And thanks to my colleagues for stepping in when my, when my audio crashed and I couldn't stay on. So um, thanks to them as well. All the best. Bye-bye.